Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Tim Reardon. I'm the Director of Data Services of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, uh, the Regional Planning Agency for Metro Boston. I'm also a member of the Bari Advisory Committee, and I appreciate you all being here today and joining us for this afternoon session on how to link uh, evidence and community-based perspectives in the field of transportation. And, uh, and area that's near and dear to my heart, as well as the two folks who are on this small panel who will be having what we had initially envisioned as a fireside chat. Now it's more of a bedside chat, I think. Um, so, so Vivian, thank you so much for, um, for joining us remotely. I'm really glad that we're going to be able to, um, uh, to get the benefit of your expertise and, and your invaluable perspective. And um, so on the screen is Vivian Ortiz, um, who is a um, uh, resident of Mattapan, uh, involved in a lot of uh, organizations, including the Neponset Greenway Council, uh, Mattapan Food and Fitness Coalition, many others, which I, I don't know if I necessarily need to, to list them right now. But um, uh, and, and in her day, she also works on active transportation on safe routes to school. So someone who is, really lives and breathes uh, all of the hard work that has to do with active transportation and, more importantly, community engagement. Um, on the stage here, Yasha Franklin Hodge, who is the Chief of Streets for the City of Boston, um, who has a long experience in technology and the relationship of, as formerly as the, let's see, Chief, yeah, please, Information. Chief Information Officer for the City of Boston, and then at the, um, at the, now I'm going to forget that. Op Open Mobility Foundation, thank you. Um, and so we're, we're gonna, I wanna talk with the two of them about issues related to, to data and the way that we think about what kind of data we need and how we, um, how we integrate that with the valuable local knowledge and lived experiences of the communities um, that we all, um, that many of us work in. Um, and I wanna start actually with, um, well, I need to start with a plug for MAPC. Uh, I just want to let folks know that yesterday we released our uh, our new regional plan called Metro Common 2030, which is a long, long 2050, a long range plan out to the year 2050, um, with a very um, equity focused and sustainability focused policy agenda uh, for state, local, and federal action in many cases. And I would encourage you to check it out at metrocommon.mapc.org. Um, but I want to. The, the reason I bring that up is because I'm contractually obligated to, but also because uh, Representative Ayanna Presley was at the release event yesterday, and she said something that I thought was, was really, really important and something really important to, to, to keep in mind. She said, she described that policy was her love language, and policy is, is where we legislate hurt and harm and where we can also legislate repair and renewal. And that is, you know, that is what we work on. We work on policy, and we have to think about how to, how to and, the, and the way that policy does that is in the values that we bring to it. And I want to, I bring this up because I want to preface the conversation. We're going to talk about data, we're going to talk about research and measurements and indicators and everything, but we also have to keep in mind that all of that work and all that information is in service to the values that we advance as public agencies, as individuals, as advocacy organizations, um, and as research institutions. And so whenever we talk about data and research, we also, have to, we also have to keep in mind how are we using that and what values are we advancing in the use of research and in the use of community engagement um, and in the way and how we reach out to folks, how we interpret their feedback, how we empower folks uh, to be making decisions um, and resolving conflict about really complex transportation issues. Um, so I want to sort of, that's where I want to start. That's why I, you know, sort of want to preface it with that. And what we're going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, I have a few questions for, for Yasha and Vivian, and then, um, we'll talk for a little bit. I think we can entertain some, some questions from the, the tables. And then for about a half hour, I think we're going to turn it over to you for some, might, might ask folks to consolidate at just, uh, maybe three tables, um, to, kind of work on development of a civic research agenda that relates to transportation. Um, and so I'll have a, a prompt for you, to, for you to, uh, to work on and would love to have your brainstorming and then, and then have a conversation about that at the end of the session. Um, so I'm afraid I have to... find my phone. 
unless someone has, oh, here it is. Uh, to find the questions that I, that I got, I want to make sure that I, that I get them right and report them as I had promised to um, my panelists here. Uh, but the first question is, is for Vivian. Um, and someone who's um, you know, really involved in this space and I think is involved and is well aware of how data is used and the, the kinds of data that transportation planners and policy makers um, use to, um, to, uh, to do that work. And, and we, we often talk about the ways the data from traditional sources like the census or transportation surveys often doesn't really capture the full range of experiences um, in a community, and that there's lots of people who are missed by the data, and a lot of blind spots because of the way that data is collected. And so my question for, for Vivian is, what aspects of, of your life and your lived experience do you think are probably not very well represented in data sets about Boston and about Mattapan, and why is understanding those things really essential to planning for transportation for your community? Okay, first of all, I just want to Make sure folks know. I really, really wish that I could be there with you. Um, I'm just gonna. I'm in a hospital in New York City. I did the 40 mile bike ride on Sunday, and after that, I fell on the sidewalk. I am the person that teaches people pedestrian safety, and unfortunately, I had an incident, so I'm here with a fractured tibia, waiting to have surgery. Otherwise, I would definitely be in the space with you guys. So, um, so when it comes to data, um, uh, talking about the lived experiences, what I want to just kind of share with folks is that. Oftentimes when we're having public meetings, when it has to do with transportation, data is presented or data is made reference to, but it often isn't shared with the community. And then living in Mattapan and other spaces where now there's a lot of transportation focused things that are happening, which is wonderful, great. We really appreciate them having them. It's just the, the idea of becoming better prepared, sharing that information, giving the, 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 reviewing it and if people ask about the data they're going to question where did you get that from how did you get that so if there's a way to be able to get folks to be more involved in the collection of that data or just explaining better why it is that the data was collected would be really helpful um as far as lived experiences there's oftentimes we'll, we'll be in a meeting and information is being shared about crash data let's say when we were pre preparing for this and just Folks will question, where did you get that from? Is that accurate and things like that? Be prepared to share where that is coming from. Um, these are communities that may not have had the opportunity to be involved in any, any type of this research. Um, we're not saying that the data is false, but just be prepared to give more information about, and then how this may relate to their personal experiences. So if it's crash data or you know crime data, whatever it may be, be prepared to answer those questions because there are a lot of trust issues that we need to work through and people are going to question you. So that's what I'll, I'll share for now. So share for now, so. Great, thank you, Vivian. Um, Yasha, next question is for you. Uh, you're involved um, in this major re-envisioning of Blue Hill Avenue um, and the integration of, of much more explicit multimodal, um, you know, the, the attempt to, to turn it into a truly multimodal corridor. and. I guess, unlike a lot of past efforts, this is there's a very intentional um, efforts to engage a lot of community members in what that's going to look like and how that's going to work. But also, as a city agency, there's a lot of technical decisions that have to be made about stop spacing and lane widths and um, stop timing, signal timing, and that sort of thing. So, um, what are some of the critical things, like known unknowns, um, in that design process that could be answered with data, but that you don't have. Things that you might be looking for that maybe even the community can't answer, but other things that, that you'd, like to, you'd like to be able to, to analyze or, um, or use to improve that design. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you, and uh, Vivian, I'm so sorry you can't be here in person. You are, uh, you are missed, but uh, amazing uh, of you to join us uh, remotely, uh, given the circumstances. So really appreciate that, and I hope Hope everything goes smoothly. Um, and so, um, to 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 answer that question, I mean, I think the the challenges we face when it comes to data in, in a project like the Blue Hill Avenue design are, in some ways, less about 
the things you just mentioned. It's less about lane widths and stoplight, uh, you know, traffic signal timing and things like that. Like these are fairly well studied and well understood disciplines. We have standards. We have. Uh, you know, guidance, there's certainly plenty of debate at the margins about, um, you know, what uh, values are implicit in these standards and the guidance that we follow and how we might reconsider some of our standards and our, um, and, and our methodologies for, you know, timing a traffic signal or um, designing a layout of a right-of-way. But at the end of the day, like, that is what our transportation and, and public works engineering teams live and breathe every day. And so they're very well versed in that. They're very skilled at working through those kinds of technical issues. I think where we as a city struggle, and I, and I think many people who are involved in um, designing and building public space struggle, is not in the weeds of their own discipline. It's at the intersections of their discipline and other disciplines that are affected sometimes very profoundly by the work that they do. So, you know, if you think about a street like Blue Hill Ave, you know, this is this corridor that we're working on is about three, a little over three miles of this street. Um, it runs through some amazing neighborhoods in Boston. Uh, it, these are neighborhoods that I think represent in many ways the heart of the black community in Boston. Um, there are an incredible number of cultures and languages and, um, and you know, experiences represented along that corridor. Um, it's also a, a street that cuts through, uh, you know, one of the higher poverty areas of the city. Um, it's a street that I think if you look at its history and the history of the surrounding community, you know, you, you can see some of the legacies of discriminatory uh, public practice in, you know, the allocation of resources, in uh, the way we maintain public space. Um, you can see the challenges that affect many low-income communities uh, in Boston and beyond. And so we have to recognize that history, that the challenge, the opportunity, the resources that are there when we think about redesigning that street. It's not just about transportation, right? It's about public health. It's about economic vibrancy. It's about quality of life. It's about art and culture. It's about creating space that helps people feel connected, that gives people a desire to be stewards of the, the, the spaces that they share, right? These are the sort of, these are the things that are not taught in you know, civil engineering school. And these are the things that in many ways I think we are um, you know, increasingly and, and I think very much to the credit of, of people who came before me were, are very aware of but not necessarily have the toolkit to address. So it's a very long-winded way of saying, right, I think some of the data that, that we're missing is at those intersections. You know, I'm reading recently some of the, the research that's emerged around the connection between noise and traffic noise and public health. Right? Fascinating area of emerging research, not something that we think about in you know, the design of our roadways, the materials we use, um, you know, looking at the connections between public space, vibrancy of public space and economic activity, right? Intuitively, we know that there is a connection, but it's very hard to quantify. It's not a thing that we sort of have in our practical practitioner toolkit to say, you know, if we make these kinds of interventions, these are the kinds of economic benefits we can expect the community to reap. So I think that's, that's in some ways the, the, the broad set of themes, um, environmental uh, and, uh, uh, you know, issues ranging from heat island effect to air quality, like all of these are the kind of places where I think we, we, we need help uh, and research that um, helps us make good decisions when we go about building streets. Great. That's, that's excellent. And I think um, sort of I'm glad there's so much more awareness these days of like looking at those intersections. I, 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 I kind of want to ask a similar question, go back and ask a similar question that I, I did to Vivian, which is, which is when you're out talking to members of the community, are, are there things that they say, well, you don't understand X, Y, or Z about the community, like in the sense that like these are, these are things that, that you could know? What are some of those, are there, are there gaps that people say, and Vivian, you can chime in here too, but like are there, are there things that, that people say, well, this isn't accounting for something that, that you could have known coming in, but you didn't know was a... Yeah, I mean that happens all the time, and it happens everywhere in the city. Yeah, um, you know, and it's and it's not. I mean, to your point about lived experience, right? N you know, we can have 
you know, an, a diverse team. We can have a team that that you know, in, inside City Hall, that reflects sort of as much as broad a set of perspectives as as we can muster. But there's always going to be things we don't know about what happens on a block, about you know, the history of how a crosswalk got to be where it is, mm -hmm. about you know the. Um, you know, the event that's near and dear to the heart of members of the community that, you know, doesn't show up on Google Maps, but, uh, you know, the, the church that has, you know, a, a, a weekly event that, you know, brings elders from the community together that, you know, we don't necessarily know that that's there and what the implications are for decisions we make about roadway layout. So, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not, you know, it's not so much that we're sort of missing information, we need somebody else to come and provide it for us. It's that the process of community engagement exists precisely so that we can learn these mm -hmm. things because it will never be something we walk into the room having. Um, and I think the importance of the way we do that process, the, the two things that I think are, and there's, there's a lot that goes into it, but the two things that I think are most critical is one, starting from a place of some humility and recognizing there's a lot you don't know, and two, really being intentional about how you listen and who you listen to, because I think in government, frequently, community engagement is often shorthand for like having a meeting, giving a presentation, letting people make comments, and then going back and doing what you thought you were going to do at the outset. And um, you know that that's both not humble and not listening, um, but it's also that format of a meeting, you know, where you sort of you invite people to come in and, and respond to you. That that reaches a certain subset of the community, but rarely is it a representative subset of the community. So, you know, we've started to become much more intentional about, you know, on Blue Hill Ave, we and our, and some of our partners in this work. They ride the bus. They talk to people on the bus. They go door to door to small businesses. They, uh, you know, they try to understand some of the community anchor institutions and the uh, the places where people gather. And they go to those places rather than saying, you know, this this you know uh, a community center at 6 p.m. on a Tuesday night is your opportunity to to get involved in this project. Right? We still do that, but that's not all we do because if we only do that we're not actually listening to large swaths of the community. Yeah. Vivian, I want to check in and see if you have just thoughts. Exactly what Yasha was just talking about right now, because um, the, the traditional setting and the way or the traditional um, focus that we've used when it comes to public meetings are requiring folks to come to a particular place at a certain time and give their input. And, and that doesn't work in, in communities like ours, because the folks that are able to go to those meetings are the ones that the, the loudest voices and decisions are based on what they're asking for, but there's a whole other segment of the population that is using Blue Hill Avenue by riding a bus or walking or may not go into those businesses. So the type of community engagement that we're working on with Blue Hill Ave is, as Yasha was saying, like, let's get on the bus and talk to the people that are on the bus that have absolutely no idea that Blue Hill Avenue is going to be redesigned. And they're the folks that are going to be able to benefit from that the most, because mm -hmm. right now it's the folks that are already engaged that already know we can't just continue sending out information, you know, like through websites, we got to be posting things we got to be out in those spaces where people are at, because there's a lot of trust building that needs to be taking place. And folks have never been asked to be a part of that engagement, and they don't all have the resources to be involved. So this is going to be a very different way. Um, because we need to hear the voices of those individuals. Otherwise, we're going to take the lead of the ones that are that feel that this project is going to inconvenience them. And, and we can't continue moving that way because everybody agrees that Blue Hill Ave is messy. It needs to be fixed. But we need to listen from everyone to be able to get the input on how it can be better. And one of the, the, the greater things that we're doing in this process, which we learned also from Cummins Highway, is it's not just the street. You know, it has to do with heat resiliency. It has to do with trees are placed. It has to do with bus stops. And I've, I've challenged, you know, when, when we're having the conversation as to where we're going to place the bus stop. So did we go to the bus stops and ask the people that are riding the bus as to where the best space is? And that doesn't always happen. So we're asking folks for, to make decisions on, on a type of transportation that they don't use. It's more that like, I'd much rather have it there because maybe it inconveniences me if the buses stop there. And we need to make sure that we're asking the folks that actually use that corridor in whatever manner it is that they do um, to make sure that, that we're making the better decisions. Otherwise, it's gonna be another one of these projects that the city did this and they didn't ask us. 
So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the point about trust building is so critically important across so many, whether it's, you know, health, education, transportation, I think we've, you know, practitioners in every discipline have broken the trust of communities of color and low income communities for hundreds of years. And we've got a lot of work to do to try to rebuild that and be patient. And that is, that is very hard sometimes when there's also, let's just say a mayor who has a sense of urgency, right? And how do you talent, how do you, how do you balance those two things? So um, I just want to add something. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to work on a federally funded grant that took place in communities throughout the city of Boston. And the way this was a model that was a little bit different because we were doing a lot of the work that the Boston Public Health Commission had already done. It had to do with sugary beverages and, and um, smoke free housing and all that. But what made it different was that we were able to stipend individuals in each one of those communities to be the ones that were working with their neighbors to be asking the question. So it wasn't, again, the city is coming to ask us and then they're going to be gone when this project is done. And so we were able to find folks that may might not have been necessarily as involved in this process. To this day, that, that grant ended a long time ago, but now they're in spaces in their community that now they feel more a part of that never in, in the past had they been. So making sure that you've got folks that are in the community that are ones that are speaking to their neighbors tends to be so much more effective because it's not like the project is gone and then the city is gone and that's it. It's people that are already living there and then they, they continue with the engagement on whatever it may be that, that the city or the state or, or any agency is working on. Yeah, the, your, your comment about sort of, the, you know, who we're talking to and the different perspectives that folks may have about taking a lane away or putting the bus stop here or there, sort of highlights, you know, presages the, ne the next question, you know, about that what happens when, um, uh, what happens when, you know, you have lots of, lots of perspectives that don't all agree or, when folks don't even agree on sort of some of the basic facts of the situation, like how many people are riding the bus, how many people would benefit from, from the bus versus, you know, having, you know, I don't know, faster signals or something like that. How do we, you know, so I think you came up, just listed a few really important, you know, ways of engaging folks with stipends and so forth, but what are some other models for engaging community members in shared learning and fact finding so that we have sort of a real shared basis of understanding um, uh, that can support better dialogue around these complex and challenging issues. Like what, what would that model look like to say, here's a question, let's try to answer it together as, you know, as a community and as the public agencies who are working on this. How, how, could, we, how could we approach that? That's, I guess a question for both of you, but I don't know who wants to start. I'll, I'll, I think I'll go first because um, having outdoor activities, you know, just um, workshops and things so that folks can be in that space. It's like when, when parking day that takes place, folks don't necessarily really know what, how much space that takes. What could you do? How could you reimagine this space being used? People need to be in the space where the change is happening. If it's only in a public meeting and you've only got you know, like something on a screen that's explaining it and you're only giving the dimensions, you really need to be in that space. So when folks are sometimes opposed to something happening, I'll say, let's go out to Cummins Highway so you can really see what it looks like, what it feels like in this space, because if you're only experiencing the street and that one form of transportation, it's really hard for you to kind of get that perspective. So having some fun activities, having, you know, less formalized engagement, um, we're talking about putting together some models of how the street could look like for, for folks to be able to, I don't want to say like Lego, but just kind of get a feel as to like, what would this design look like? Because we often do get those designs of, you know, like, what does the street look like? The, the however many feet wide the bike lane is and all of that. It's really hard to get that without actually being in that space. So having more of that type of community engagement and getting input, but also letting folks know there are some parameters that they're just not negotiable, right? There are standards that have to be met. We can't just put a speed bump, speed hump there because you think that that would be better. There are guidelines that have to be met, but being able to explain why or why not, something can happen. It's just when folks say that's just not possible without really giving any kind of explanation. To me, that's very disrespectful. It's almost like you're saying, you're not gonna understand it, so we're not even gonna bother, right? And then as a person that travels throughout the city and I go to a meeting somewhere else and I see that the presentation is being done differently, that's when I'm like, okay, no, don't assume that because whatever, 
we need to come up with kind of a standard. And then you just kind of gauge the audience and figure out what do folks get, what don't, ask questions. Do you understand this? Can you share back what it is that we're talking about? I learned everything from being at public meetings and raising up my hand and saying, I don't understand what you're talking about. Can you please explain it? Giving people that opportunity and um, what is it? That confidence to be able to, to ask a question and that. So it's just different ways of engaging with the community, so, so. Yeah, or or even better, having having meetings that encourage folks to raise their their hand, or maybe even make it not necessary by by making sure that there is that shared understanding. Yasha, your thoughts on this? Yeah, just building. Uh, I very much agree with Vivian, and uh, you know, one of the uh, Vivian very graciously after my appointment got announced offered to take me on a, a bike tour of uh, Mattapan, and uh, you know, in that spirit of sort of understanding the space and seeing the, the specific places and, um, you know, having, uh, you know, I'd spent a bit of time there previously, but but getting a chance to do that via that mode of transportation, uh, you know, with somebody who has such, uh, you know, incredible on the ground knowledge and perspective was incredible for me to be able to sort of know what I'm looking at when I look at a, you know, a sheet plan and say, oh, okay, that's that street and that's what it felt like. That's what the experience was like. That was the thing that, you know, we, I sort of got the story about and now I, I kind of have that context. So um, very much in agreement with that. Uh, I, th I think building on this sort of idea of like creating space for people to ask questions, in, in some ways if the first piece of community engagement is, here's a new design, what do you think? You, you may have already lost, right? You, you can do that for certain types of uh, projects, but I think it's helpful if you can create the space and the time to have a little bit of discussion that isn't necessarily grounded in a specific project decision or a specific trade-off, but rather is about a goal, a value, a vision for how something could be. So Vivian referenced the Cummins Highway project, which is a, another project that we have ongoing in Mattapan right now. It's actually further along than the Blue Hill Ave project. Um, and I think in some ways this kind of represents a real, uh, you know, a, a, a somewhat novel attempt on the part of the city to create space for learning and conversation that's, that's a little bit Lower stakes is the wrong word, but that's 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 more inclusive of learning as as kind of a core goal. So we've held a series of community meetings um, on this project. I, I want to say it's more than a dozen, and many of them ha are thematic in nature. So it's talking. You know, we'll have a meeting about um, age-friendly streets. We'll have a meeting about heat island effect. We'll have a meeting about. Um, active transportation. We'll have a meeting uh, about safety and speed. And all of these are grounded in the physical place where we're talking about doing things. But all of these are, you know, we don't start the meeting saying, this is the design and here's why it's good for heat island effect. We start the meeting talking about the role that trees play in heat and the environment. We start the meeting with you know, experts who are not transportation planners sharing what they know and what they care about, creating space for community members to learn, to ask questions, to challenge our worldview on, on how we prioritize things and balance things. And I think those kinds of approaches to engagement, although labor intensive, are in many ways the foundation for building, you know, the kinds of trust that, um, you know, that that we need to do, and 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 authentically creating space for people to actually learn. Um, I, I think another dynamic in all of this is um, it's important to have space for people to learn from each other and to hear from each other. You know, you sort of started this, Tim, by asking this, your question by asking about, you know, what do we do when people don't even agree on basic facts or or goals, right? And it's helpful for people to see that their perspective on the world is not the only perspective on the world. Not, not, not the city coming in saying, we're right, this is, this is truth, right? But rather, you know, when, I, I mean, one of the most fascinating and I think helpful dynamics of community conversations is when people disagree with each other in the community. And, you know, that, that in some ways is, is a far more powerful way to kind of give people perspective than anything we the city can do, but we can create the space for people to have respectful uh, conversations where they, they, they expand their lens uh, on, the, uh, on the world. Um, and then the last thing I was just gonna say on this, right, is 
it is always a goal to reach uh, you know, broad agreement about any path forward, but it's not always possible to have consensus. It's almost pretty much always impossible to have true consensus. And there are some times when we have, when there is a real divide within a community about a path forward. And it's not, a, you know, it's not a divide about sort of, you know, I want this thing this many feet or I want it that many feet. It's a divide about values. It's a divide about vision of what's more important and what to, um, you know, what the future should look like, what future people want to have in their city, in their neighborhood. And so, you know, I think it's important for us not to shy away from recognizing that when we find ourselves in that situation, and also not shy away from being willing to articulate what, what our values are as a city, as an administration, um, to be able to say, for example, that, you know, we will prioritize the safety of people who are vulnerable on our streets over the speed of traffic, right? Like, that's a value statement, and it's not something that I think the city has always been comfortable articulating publicly because um, it makes some people really unhappy to hear that if their worldview is like, you know, actually sometimes moving, moving cars is the priority, right? So, you know, I think, I think there just needs to be a certain amount of um, work done to, to both know what our values are and then to make sure we can articulate them. And when we are making a decision that we know will be unwelcomed by some percentage of people, you know, to Vivian's point, it's like you can't just sort of, you, you have to say why, and sometimes that's a technical reason, but sometimes that's, that's, a, that's a values reason, and, and we have to be willing to do that. Great. Vivian, I saw your head nodding up and down there a lot. I just want to see if you have anything you want to add on to, to Yasha's. I always have something that I'm going to add on. Yeah, I know you do. That, right? I always have something I'm going to add on. But... Um, we, we have a situation in, in, in some of the work that we're doing now that there are folks in our neighborhood that have been around for a very long time. And they've already seen the city so many times make these promises and things like that. So we as members in the community with some of our, our um, colleagues in the city, we've taken kind of a step back to listen to that group of individuals in a smaller group setting. Let's hear what those concerns are because it's it's like, we can't continue with these folks constantly saying no. Let's hear about the history of what it is that you've experienced and then start talking about, and, and what, what Yasha said about the city has values and the city is going to state this is like, this is going to happen, to, to be more comfortable to be able to say that because these folks now are like, they're never gonna do it because we're gonna scare them away and we're just gonna continue to say no. But having that conversation, listening to what had happened in the past, and then maybe using them as kind of like advisory members, just kind of finding a role for them to play in this so that we can come together on, on this and it's not like we either scare the city away or whatever. And just saying, we all agree it's messy. We're gonna have to come up with a solution. Give us some ideas on some of the solutions that you think might work. And then, you know, letting them know, these folks are professionals, this is what they do. So having sometimes that, that conversation that takes a little bit longer to try to get folks to understand, again, this is not the city doing this. We wanna make this happen. Let's work together as a team. Will you help us with this? That hasn't traditionally happened. It's, it's been this is constant, we already know we're gonna go in there and such and such person is the one that's gonna say, this isn't gonna work and then we gotta fight that. We decided, let's just take a moment, have a conversation with them, see how we can bring them in, acknowledge what they've gone through, the value that they bring to this and we can work together as a team. And so far it looks like it's working. Um, yeah, because, you know, we, we've talked about trust earlier and, you know, the, the infrastructure investments can, you know, can last for, you know, 40 years or something. But if people feel like they're not listened to and they feel that they're not, that, that, that whether or no matter how good objectively that, that, that outcome is, that damage of people feeling like, not that it didn't turn out the way they wanted, but that they weren't even listened to, that breach of trust then, the, 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 the repercussions of that last a lot longer and then affect every other project that comes down the line in that exactly. neighborhood and in the city. Yeah. It's like, you already know if you're gonna go there immediately the, from the get-go, nope, we don't yeah. want this, we yeah. didn't ask for this. And yeah. trying to change that, that conversation still. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Um, so I want to I want to talk about one other thing, which is slightly it, it may be a little wonkier, but I think is important. Um, and then we'll turn to the table discussions. And this is this is about you know when we think about these big transformational changes, when we think about adding bike paths and stuff. Part of part of the success of those also depends on how people respond to them. And we can engage people and talk to them, but we don't actually know. Are people going to get out of their cars and get on the bus? Are folks going to use that bike lane, right, or that bike path, or what have you? And there's some folks who are going to be in the community who are saying, no one's going to use that. No one's going to do it, so we shouldn't. And, and we have to, in order to be intellectually honest, we have to admit that there's uncertainty in what's going to happen. How do we talk about that uncertainty with communities without kind of undermining the rationale for doing these projects? How can we, I mean, a lot of this is about that, you know, Trust building, but are there are there are there specific things in which kind of that that element of of uncertainty and unknown and sort of let's let's hold hands and take the jump together um, that could um, you know any any ways that 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 particular sort of challenge could be addressed. Um, it's a good question. It's it's a hard one. Um, I mean, I think the first thing is just sometimes you just have to say I don't know. And you know, or you know, we're learning here. This is what we want to learn. This is what we're going to try. This is what we hope it will tell us. Um, you know, I, I also so so so. I mean, I think just just having, you know, the the confidence to be honest is maybe uh, one of the important starting points for this. Um, I, I also think it's helpful to, um, you know, pe people have strong sort of loss aversion bias, right? And so. You know, and nowhere is that more true than in the, the spaces and places they inhabit. And so I think understanding that, you know, even if people look at a situation and, and sort of want to see it get better, they're often doing the math of like, well, what could I lose? What could I lose if, you know, one of these lanes becomes a bus lane? What could I lose if, um, you know, there are four less parking spaces on my street, and that becomes the thing that dominates the conversation. And so while it doesn't, you know, while it's not a, it's not a solution to that challenge, I think grounding people in the, the status quo and an, a, a different vision for the future and making that, making that part of the conversation can be really, really helpful. I mean, I, I have, you know, there's, there's, this happens all over the city, but in another part of the city, you know, we have a project where there's a question about whether to create additional vehicular capacity somewhere. And, and you know, the concern is like, oh, there's so many new people coming into the neighborhood. You know, how are we going to accommodate all of this? And, you know, the, the, what I have to go back to is it's like, you know, do you like the status quo? Because the status quo is terrible, and you've told us this, right? It's congestion, there's, it's impossible to park, right? So, so nothing I can do from a traffic engineering or transportation engineering perspective is going to sort of allow us to, you know, double the population of this neighborhood without making the problem you've already told me you hate worse, right? So let's talk about what a better future could look like. Let's talk about the vision of, you know, how do we add people? How do we build more housing? How do we bring more neighbors into your and more energy into your community without making you know doubling down on all of the problems it, again it doesn't it's not a solution to this because I think ultimately like I can't promise that that vision will come true but I can promise that if we keep doing what we've always been doing that the things you hate are just gonna get worse and so you know at least um, creating that space to have a, a, a conversation pointed at something that um, is, a, is, is a better future. It, it, you know, again, there's no easy answers to this, but it's a way to sort of, um, you know, to, to, to acknowledge uncertainty, but also I, I think acknowledge that the choices that we make, whatever they are, even if it's to just keep things as they are, are the choices that shape the reality we live in. And if we don't like what we have, we have to make different choices. Yeah, doing doing nothing is a choice, right? Exactly. That is that is much of a choice as doing something. Vivian, what are your what are your thoughts on this? Things that I'm I'm going to try to be encouraging about to try to encourage folks to do that are just you know this is going to be terrible by by having this this bike lane and this center running bus lane. It's just going to be so much worse. Let's go on a let's go on the bus together now because I don't know when the last time was that that individual 
use that space differently. And it's just like, let's just kind of see what that experience is like now for the folks that are using the bus, trying to see if we can build some empathy. That's the only way, because if, if, if you're only thinking of how difficult it is for you, and maybe they might realize, oh, well, maybe this isn't that bad. I, I just can't think of, it's gotta be invitations to just say, you're, ma- you're forming an opinion about something that you haven't experienced. You're mm-hmm. feeling that the reason that everything is so terrible is because these buses or whatever it might be. I would love to be able to get people to come and ride a bike on Blue Hill Avenue with me. I know that's not possible, right? But just inviting folks to come and use those spaces differently and, and have conversations with those individuals that are, that are not traveling the same way they do is, is really the only way that I can think of, of, of bringing that together because it's very different to only see it in that one manner in which you travel. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to turn to the discussions. I'm actually going to throw out one that I didn't I didn't prep you for, which is which is this maybe the same question I'll give to the tables, which is if there were a group of academics and students and public agencies working on new research in this area. So the work of, you know, we've talked a lot about the work of engagement, of think about experience, about communication, about trust building. All of these are really essential, right? But the R in Bari is research and it's about creating new knowledge. Like if there was new knowledge that you felt like is really essential to advancing those conversations, or that if you keep saying, you know, honestly, I don't know, then sooner or later, people are going to be like, well, we're going to stop having this conversation until you know, until you can answer this question, because that's your job. What are some of those things? Or Vivian, to you, like, what are, what do you think are maybe some of the questions that could be that, that I'm, if I'm we ready. Just I'm ready. More knowledge. You ready? All right. I'll stop. I'll stop. I'm ready practicing. because it's one of the things that during my day job. So I work with the Safe Routes to School program where I'm working. We're trying to figure out how could we get families that are driving their children to school to allow them to walk to school. So there's a question that we are never really able to capture from folks as to like, why is it that you are using this mode of transportation right now? Because it's not just a quick, easy check. And like just having more of that. Um, data that's pulled as to why are you so resistant to wanting to do this? And then what would, what would, um, what would it take in order for you to maybe consider using this space differently? That's a question that amongst our, in the community engagement work, whatever, we don't really know how to capture that from folks. Uh So I don't know if there's, you know, it's, it's going to be mostly, you know, qualitative data, but, but just knowing why it is, because I don't think we ever ask that. When we come into community meetings, we'll ask something like, how did you get here? And I'm already like, you know, I'm biased. It's like, oh, all these people that are coming in cars, but how do we find out from them? Why is it that you still only choose to use a car? What would it take for you to maybe start thinking of using another mode of transportation differently? Right. Because they're complaining about how terrible the traffic is, right? So let's right. try to figure out a, a different right. way of, of looking at this. So that's the question yeah. that I would appreciate. Superb. Getting some help with. Yasha? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. Um, I think I think maybe um, you know two two things kind of come to mind. I, I alluded to one of them earlier, but um, you know we one one of the big sort of tensions in in any kind of right of way allocation challenge is around the um, especially in it well in a in a in a place that has businesses right is the impacts on local businesses and I think there's um, a, a set of questions um, which I will probably not articulate well up here on the fly around uh, the way that different street typologies and um, and design characteristics of a street uh, impact businesses what what are the sort of um, the, the, some of the drivers of a successful, some of the built environment drivers of a successful local business district, um, and how do we sort of quantify some of those things, or at least understand better the the um, the, the 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 relationships, the causal relationships that exist between choices that we make about the built environment and um, what that does, not only to sort of you know, any given business on any given block, but how those choices impact change in business districts over time, the, the mix of businesses that are there, the, um, you know, displacement of businesses as well as uh, growth and, and success of, of those that are there. Um, so I think that's one sort of general area that I feel like we're not, um, 
and there may be some good research out there that we don't know, but uh, where I think there's probably uh, some opportunities to help answer some questions. Um, and then I guess the other, you know, the other is much more of a, it's, it's more of a squishy and more sociological thing, but, um, you know, understanding how, um, how cities, how governments build trust, how governments build a sense of, um, you know, t Vivian talked about sort of, you know, the, the sense of like, oh, the city's coming and doing this to us, right? What is it, what is a, what is a model of a different kind of uh, trust look like where, uh, you know, the, the sense is that we're partners in this, that we're, that we have a, um, you know, that we're being listened to, that we have skin in the game, that this, that a, a local government is, um, you know, they're doing something with us. We may not always like what they do, but that we're, we're in the room, we're not out of the room. And I think that's, it's a lot of it's around the dynamics of, of perception of power and, uh, and stewardship and all of this. Um, I, I think we, we have a lot to learn about that and uh, I think would love uh, to, to have some help and maybe partnership with folks who are, who are trying to explore different ways to understand that, that landscape of trust and to, and to build it. Great, well thank, thank you to both of you for those really um, interesting suggestions. Um, and I'm gonna turn it with, with that, you know, for the, the benefit of all your insights so far and those ideas, I wanna turn it to the table and I guess I give you a charge and then I'm actually not exactly sure how much time we have, but I'll set you loose. Um, uh, is to, to formulate, like, what are, some, what are some ideas for uh, research activities that could be undertaken by academic institutions, other research institutions in the region, public agencies, such as, you know, MAPC or City, City of Boston or, or others, and nonprofits, it could be jointly done that would help to address not just these sort of three questions, three sort of ideas that, that Vivian and Yasha just suggested, but really this whole challenge. And I think these are two, these are a couple really good examples because, you know, both of them, some of them are qualitative, they're about behaviors and attitudes and like, trust building, and then some of them might be a little more quantitative, like let's look at tax receipts when you put in a bike lane or something. So, um, but there are, there are other things. So what I asked folks to do is, I'm wondering if we could kind of consolidate at three tables so that we'll have maybe six or seven people per table. Um, and um, what I'd suggest is maybe brainstorm for five minutes on some ideas, and then, um, and then if folks could pick one or two or three and focus on them a little more and try to flesh them out a little bit as kind of research ideas that might be advanced and, and talked about with a broader community. These could be things that relate to qualitative studies. It could be about metrics of current conditions. It could be new ways of forecasting. Who knows? Um, but, um, you know, I think the idea is it should, it should bear on some of these issues that, that relate to um, uh, that relate to transportation, to equity, and also the ways that, that folks are engaged, and the way that practitioners learn from community about the things that we don't know, and that community learns from practitioners, and has opportunities to broaden their perspective about, um, about the experience of others. So maybe if we can group up, and then I'll, I'll give you more um, uh, clarity on timing as soon as I figure out when this session is supposed to end, and then we'll come back. So Vivian, don't go away, if, if that's okay. We'll come back and, and close. So hopefully hear some ideas from the tables. Does that sound good? I got a thumbs up if that sounds okay? All right. Okay. Well, I'm gl glad to see both tables still talking, but I um, have been instructed to get us wrapped up by um, the next few minutes, by four, maybe a little after. But I'd love to hear, um, maybe hear from, from each table about some of the more promising ideas or questions or other, other insights. Uh, I think we have some microphones, um, if folks want to use that. And that way, um, Vivian and the folks on, the, um, uh, on Zoom will be able to hear. So who, which table would like to volunteer to start first? We'll do this one over here, since the microphone is close. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Claire. I work for the YMCA. Uh, we talked about many things, um, including research methods. Like um, we had a misunderstanding, which led to an idea that there was a meeting in a box 
um, which you put all the things you need for a meeting in a box that you carry around. But we were envisioning a box that you carry around to then physically enter and conduct your meeting, which would create Excuse sort me, of a, an intimate environment for yeah. the interviewee to make them feel comfortable. Like and one of like, those storage units that you go perhaps. around on the trailer? We would, we would create ambiance, obviously, but... Yeah, yeah, like that you, okay. you know, you could take people and do inter, um, individual interviews. But um, what we just ended on was sort of a conundrum around um, public transportation and pupil transportation and the challenges. I work with Boston Public Schools and the challenges that they face in terms of um, making sure that students get to school safely and back home and that um, it's definitely a systemic issue. We didn't really get to a, a research question because I'm on the side of like, these kids are still at school. Why haven't they been picked up? And there's chronic absenteeism because of uh, an inability to get a school bus on time. But from the perspective of folks in the transportation office, they want to solve it too. We want to pay our drivers a living wage. We want to do a lot of things. And so I don't think we came to a conclusion around what the research question is that we need to answer, but that there's an issue there that all parties would be interested in, in solving. Great. All right. I think that's a very, I think that actually is a good level of specificity for a conversation. Um, and I can imagine sort of, starting with some sort of user-centered approach about you know, talking to parents about their experience and trying to understand what some of those barriers are. Very similar to what Viv to Vivian suggested, but sort of a little more. And I love the idea. We could do it in a school bus. You could use a converted you know, electric school bus with di disco ball inside. Yeah, yeah. Great. I'll turn to this table over here. Can I just ask something really yeah. quickly? I had a hard time hearing what folks were saying. So whomever is speaking could speak more into the microphone. Great. Thank you. OK. Yep. All right. Uh, I'll try to characterize. We, we had a pretty wide ranging conversation. Um, let's see. So we talked a lot about business owners and their responses to changes to roadways in particular um, and how to address their reactions um, that led us into trying to under, understand whether uh, those reactions are best addressed through data or through some other form that doesn't uh, offend the sort of sometimes very reactive uh, lizard brain kind of response that 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 sometimes we see. Um, let's see. One of those ideas was sort of proposing more images, um, images of what, you know, or try to get to the shared vision, images of what a different levels of density might look like. Um, also, tr when people have that sort of reaction, try to understand their, the narrative that, that, that they're playing out behind that, that reaction. Um, mm. Make the burden, let's see, no, that's a different one. Um, we wanted to get some more data-oriented stuff about what the effects are of opening a city street, for example, uh, doing an open street uh, once, once a month what does that do for businesses? What does that do to the district? Um, have we studied that, the, the effects of that on Newberry Street? What, hap what about if it's once a week? What about if it's every day? You know, what about when it changes forever? Um, will, the, will the traffic spike during those monthly ones or, or annual ones, but not during um, day to day? Um, mm -hmm. Let's see what else was there, anything else? Probably, I'm almost, I'm definitely missing things, apologies. Uh, some uh, sort of a similar uh, question, but on a different context, looking at long stretches of, of bike lanes versus networks, um, what is available versus what is accessible, um, and, and how those, those, those types of net, the networking effects may or may not sort of contribute to use of those bike lanes, help answer the question of, you know, do you know people will use it? Um, and, uh, from a research perspective, looking at the opinion shifting, uh, people's sort of before and after uh, levels of empathy or agreement uh, with a particular idea 
after they've taken a ride on the bus or after they've walked the street with, uh, with, with a, a knowledgeable and listening guide or whether uh, or, or done the bike ride if, if you can get them to, to do that. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. I love that idea about opinion shifting and sort of trying to assess, you know, actually, and you could look at it two ways, right? One is, did this intervention, did taking someone for a ride on the bus or riding, you know, going on a, on a, on a bike path with them change their perspective on an intervention, but also how does that opinion change after a new intervention? So I, I wonder, did you guys, what I see is there's actually a link there between that, that the, the point about business owners and their concerns could you actually then go talk to business owners in places where bike lanes have been put in it's, and say, how are things? Is it okay? Was it, you know, what are the disruptions and what are the benefits might even be more useful than saying, look, the data show tax revenue went up, but actually all these business owners feel like it's actually kind of cool. So you could be with them. Yeah, the, the whole idea of the before and after, getting, getting before and after yeah. places where it has happened and where it hasn't happened or where it's fully implemented or partially implemented was sort of was another thing we, we Great. talked about. Great, thank you. Anyone, I want to I want to see if anybody at, at the tables, anybody else want to chime in on anything here? Maybe it was missed. All right, and then I'll turn it over to my, my the two panelists, Vivian and Yasha, to see if you have any final thoughts. Not obligatory, but I want to give you the opportunity if you want to, any other final wisdom you want to share. Uh, I don't know if I have any other any wisdom to share, but I, I really appreciate the ideas um, that I just heard. Uh, we're going to go back and start building a meeting box uh, for sure. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, in all seriousness, I mean, I think I think the um, you know some of the the the, the things that, that was just listed by this table around uh, potential research topics, like every one of those, we would be really interested in reading okay. that paper uh, and would be uh, you know interested collaborators in uh, producing. It so um, I think you know if if folks uh, are um, actually looking for a partnership here, uh, I just want to say the city is, is 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 open to that if we can find topics that that have good good alignment. Um, but ultimately, no. I mean, I think I think it's this is uh, uh, you know where I, I I've really appreciated this whole discussion and the fact that we found ourselves in the space of really. Um, not just looking at things through the lens of, you know, oh, this is a transportation question, or this is a this kind of question, right? These things, these things intersect, and and um, that's that's where the hard work is um, for us as practitioners and for anyone doing research. So um, excited to see these lines of, of inquiry uh, grow over time. So thank you for that. Right, thank you, Asha, Vivian. I agree with Yasha. I think you know the opportunities to be able to partner. And, and work with the community to find out what is the information that you would be interested in knowing about this? Because we always kind of come in saying, this is what we want, but what, what would you be interested in knowing about that and having the opportunity um, to, to get some feedback on the things that they feel are worthy or valuable to them as well. This was great. great. Thank you so much for the opportunity and, and for including me to be a part of this. So Well, Vivian, thank you so much for, for um being with us remotely, um, and so, so best wishes for a, for a speedy Thank recovery. Um, and we're so grateful that you uh, that you're able to join us and, and really benefited from your insight. Yasha, thanks for, for being here today, for taking some time out, and thanks for your great work at the city. I, I, as, a, as a resident and a biker and a transit rider, I, um, I appreciate the work you're doing and look forward to three great years ahead and maybe more after that. The mayor, thanks to all of you for your, um, for your great insight. Um, we really appreciate it. And I, I guess I'll close, you know, your comment on intersectionality made me think of something that also, just to go back to the Metro Common release yesterday, we had a panel discussion, the number of legislators and what Andy Vargas is a, a rep from um, uh, Northeastern Mass said was, was, if you start with equity, then you will be looking at intersections of lots of different issues. If you start with transportation, you're, might, you might get to equity or you might not. But if you start by looking, if you start with equity as your frame, you are necessarily going to be looking at the ways in which lots of different systems intersect. And so I think that was a, um, you know, a great bit of insight echoed by what Yasha said about how the thorny problems are not in the weeds, but actually at the intersection. Um, 
and, uh, and the things that, that Vivian said about the ways that, that people are interacting and, and thinking about all of the things that they need in their community. So I'd ask us to, to move forward with this. I really appreciate um, these ideas and, um, and uh, we'll be sort of putting these in the hopper as Bari continues to, uh, to work on these things. So enjoy the reception and thanks again for joining us. Yeah, a Thank round you. of applause bye -bye. for the panelists here. Thank you, Vivian. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.